And I just want to confirm, we're here for the incident on February the 4th, 2021. And that was on a Thursday where a New Mexico State Police officer was uh, shot and killed. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, were, were you working that day? I was. Okay. Can you tell me about, um, just right before how you were notified, what information was given to you and then what actions were taken? Yeah. Um, so we're notified through central dispatch um, here. Um, they page us out on our radios and over our PA here. Mm -hmm. um, and we got a call for an officer down okay. west of Aquila. Um, at that point, we didn't have, I guess, all of the information. There was a lot of information coming in. And so we kind of asked to give more information when, we, when it's available through dispatch. Um, and we placed Native Air on standby. Uh, Native Air 30 is based out of here in Deming. And so given the nature of that call, we wanted to have them on standby if needed. That's a protocol. We, we request that through central dispatch. Okay. Um, we went en route to, like, I guess the dispatch location, and it was kind of unsure of who was still on scene and, like, the actual scene scenario. I guess that information was being relayed through dispatch, um, but we knew that there was law enforcement that was on their way, um, and so the ambulance is not the quickest vehicle in the fleet, so we were kind of allowing for for the, the law enforcement to, to go faster. They're much faster than we are, so... Um, we just continued to go on route. We hadn't been directed to stage or to do anything. We just were just headed west of Aquila. Um, <clears throat> we were told that there was law enforcement on scene at a point. We weren't unclear on which one. I, I believe that they, we were told that it, Border Patrol was on scene and they had medical staff rendering aid, but that was all that we knew. We asked for where the victim had been shot, um, if they knew that, and if CPR was being started. Um, it took a minute, but dispatch was able to tell us that he had multiple gunshot wounds and that there was no pulse at this time, that there was law enforcement was rendering aid. Okay. <clears throat> and what else? Do you want to just to keep going? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Um, so, we obviously were, were just in route, I guess it would be eastbound on I-10. Um, and at a point, sheriff's officers or somebody had traffic stopped. We moved past that and we parked the ambulance and got out to, I, I don't know which law enforcement agency was rendering aid, but there was somebody that was rendering aid. Okay. Um, you just know it was law enforcement? I, I just know that that there was law enforcement. We were told they were law enforcement. I don't know that they were law enforcement. We were just told that they were law enforcement. Okay. Um, <clears throat> our chief's truck had also gone en route, um, and they were ahead of us, um, but got there shortly before us. So as we got there, we had um, the chiefs that were there with us, um, and we got all of our supplies and stuff down to start rendering aid to the officer. Mm -hmm. um, Prior to that, after kind of hearing a little bit more dispatch information as it was coming in, we did go ahead and launch Native Air. Mm -hmm. um, Native Air can do, we can meet them at the base, we can meet them at the hospital, we can launch them and have them do an in-air standby, or we can launch them and have them land at like a pre-designated area. We just essentially told them, go in the area of West Aquila and we'll give you more when we get that. Um, and we did end up eventually, we landed them on the highway. Okay. Native Air was landed on the highway. But um, as we got on scene, the supplies that we get out and the materials that we get out are just kind of our standard supplies. Um, we get everything that could be necessary to work on a patient that's involved in that type of incident. So we get all of that down, um, CPR is being performed, and then we kind of take over that. Um, they can still assist us in some manner, but we kind of take over what, what goes on at that point. Okay. Um, Position-wise, um, 
the officer was off to the, I guess it would be the south end of the road on the shoulder. Mm -hmm. um, his feet were south, I guess, or south-ish, but his feet were facing south and his head was facing north. Okay. Um, I, if I remember correctly, he was at a slight like decline um, just because the shoulder kind of falls off that way, so he was kind of at a, at a slight decline. Um, when we got to him there. Okay, and what else? Um, I don't know exactly when it occurred, but the officer's vest was, was cut. We exposed the patient. So the officer's vest was cut off, or at least the front piece of the vest was cut off, um, and the patient's exposed. Um, from my recollection, that was already done as I was getting to the patient. Um, the patient was already exposed and there had already been some, um, I guess, treatments performed like as the CPR was going. Um, there was some bandages that were placed. I say bandages, it's like an occlusive dressing over um, some wounds that were there and CPR was being performed. Okay. Um, we assessed the patient right away and confirmed that the patient was uh, pulseless. There was no breathing and there was no pulse. We confirmed that through touch and also through our life pack monitor that we use on the ambulance. So we can connect the pads and it gives us if there's a cardiac rhythm or not. We also will confirm that with a touch, you know, the opposite pulse, just check for a pulse. Um, so once we confirm what's on scene, we continue with the CPR and then manage the patient accordingly. So um, preparations for the patient's airway was assessed. Um, we prepare um, to take control of that airway and breathe for the patient if we have to. Um, start IVs and just go according to like a cardiac protocol. That like when somebody's in cardiac arrest, these are the things that we do. And that's oftentimes cardiac monitoring uh, IV access so that we can give some medications. Um, we were able to establish that at the, the, the patient's arm. Um, and then we were also able to get a secondary IV site. Um, it makes things a lot easier if you're giving medications and fluids to have two sites that you can um, give medication or fluids through. So we were able to do that. Okay. Um, as that progresses, um, so do our treatments. Um, our treatments go from, again, I don't remember if it was being done just prior to, but I know that as soon as we got there, we have a BVM, which is our bag valve mask, and we can start ventilating the patient and breathing for the patient. Um, typically, we will position the patient in as optimal of a position as you can, and you start bagging the patient. Um, that was occurring. So we're bagging the patient, um, and as you continue your assessment, if his oxygen saturations are not improving, there's other interventions that you can you can start to perform. Um, one of those being um, an intubation, where you put a breathing tube down the patient's uh, trachea, and then you're able to breathe for the patient through a tube that's clear, um, it's maintained, it's free from obstructions, things like that. Um, are you wanting to know like? specifics as far as the process for that, or you wanted to just know like? Yeah, um, just the EMS that was performed on him and what you did on scene um, with, with the officer. Um, and if you don't mind, I, I know you said when you arrived, his, uh, his chest was already exposed as his vest was removed mm -hmm. or the front part of it was removed. Mm -hmm. Were you able to view the gunshot wounds that he sustained? Uh, I believe so. Um, the scenes, they're, they're not optimal, right? Like this isn't on a, a surgical table. And so you have a lot that's going on. Mm -hmm. You have clothing, you have bandages, you have blood, you have all of these things. And so you're able to visualize that the best that you can. Um, but I wasn't going to also go backwards and undo um, like the chest yeah. seal that was put on. I'm not going to take that off to try and see if I uncover 
uh, another wound. I'm going to look and see if, if that's working, I'm going to leave it. If yeah. this is working, I'm going to leave it. And some of those had already been placed. Yeah. Um, so I was able to visualize where I assumed that there was penetrating trauma to the thorax. Okay. Um, and I was able to see multiple locations where those had been placed. Um, where was it at? Uh, left chest. Okay. Uh, I believe there was two penetrating injuries to the left chest. Two, okay. Uh, I believe there was one right chest or or very close to the midline, but right right sided. That okay. there was also a bandage placed. Okay. And then I believe that there was also a head injury. There was a, a penetrating head injury as well. As far as our other assessment um, of the patient, like extremities and things like that, you, you kind of focus on, on the injuries that are, that are most important at that point. Uh, everything else appeared, as far as like a quick assessment, appeared to be like intact. You know, at that point, if you've got broken bones of fingers or things like that, they, they kind of take a backseat to the immediate life threat problem, which at that point, there were life threats present. So yeah. those are the, the issues that we determined to fix. Okay. All right. Um, so as you kind of assess that patient, that's what you're looking for, right? You're, you're saying where, where are these injuries and what do we do to fix them or mitigate the problems that are there? So the penetrating traumas that were there um, had already been, inclusive dressings had been placed over them. We were continuing CPR and we kind of focused on the, the medication side of, of the medications that we need to give or fluids that we need to give um, and access to that and then controlling the airway. Um, airways can be difficult, especially in trauma cases because you can have things like secretions, vomitus, blood or anything like that that will obstruct the patient's airway. So we also have a suction unit that's portable that we can take and suction that airway so that we can facilitate a little bit better ventilation for the patient, um, which we had out and we were using. Um, native air was being landed uh, kind of as all of this is, is happening and native air landed in a, fair, a fairly close proximity to us on eastbound uh, I-10. So they landed in the eastbound lanes. Okay. Okay. I mean, exactly as far as like where the mile marker I was. It's okay. There. But they landed in the eastbound lanes and they have medical personnel that are critical care, um, like paramedic and a nurse that are there. And at that point, they can assist us or we can assist them in whatever interventions we need um, for the patient. Um, so as we were managing the patient's airway um, and continuing the CPR, um, breathing for the patient, we sought to take over the patient's airway um, and a couple of attempts were made to take over the patient's airway um, and start to ventilate that patient through those um, tubes mm -hmm. and Native Air assisted in doing that. I was able to, to take over the patient's airway with their equipment. Um, and so we were successfully able to ventilate the patient and we secure that airway from anything else that could obstruct it. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with like the tubes that are put down. They have a little balloon on the end. I don't. Yeah, so when you, when you put that, that tube down, you can basically make a, a clean, clear path for the air to go, which is what you want. You don't want any of the blood or anything to else to be able to obstruct mm -hmm. it. Um, so once you're able to get that, then, then you start managing like are we, how are we breathing for them how much air we're giving them um, and where that air is going was any of that working on him um, as far as the action yes was it changing how the patient was th their outcome or changing anything with the patient minimal minimal changes what do um, you mean by that minimal as far as like you can see chest rise and fall right like if you're bagging somebody you can see their chest rise and fall so you're obviously giving ventilations that work, but whether that patient is able to exchange the oxygen that you're giving them, it, it's, a, it's a minimal thing at that point if the heart's not beating. Okay. Um, so that's where it's, it, the interventions that we're performing are being performed the way that they're supposed to be. 
the body's failure to exchange that oxygen, th that's situations that are out of our control. We just have to perform okay. the action. Um, and we're trying to assist that, right? Like through CPR, we're trying to, to flow the blood so that the body can exchange that oxygen. But CPR is, is, is never going to be as efficient as the heart actually doing the work on its own. Okay. If that makes yes, a that makes sense. Um, so as we're performing these, we're reassessing to make sure that our air is going into the right places, um, and bagging is supposed to be fairly, fairly easy as far as you're supposed to be able to move that air with like little resistance. Um, and we started to note some resistance, um, which can mean a few things, but there's um, some interventions that we can perform to try and aid in that, um, and those were performed. Um, so it's a, a, a needle decompression, which basically means if there's air, which can often occur with penetrating trauma to the, to the thorax, if there's air that gets on top of the lungs, it prevents mm -hmm. those lungs from filling up. Um, there's more air outside the lung than inside. Okay. And it creates pressure and it won't allow the lung to inflate, which becomes a problem. And so one of the fixes that you can do for that is you take a, a needle and you push it through the chest wall and that allows the air that's outside of the lung to escape and so that was performed twice um, in two appropriate locations that was performed um, and also with very minimal um, change in that um, okay. uh, we continued CPR um, we continued to to, to bag the patient. Mm -hmm. A lot of this is going on at the same time or very close to, in, in that timeline. Um, but as we're looking at our monitor, we can see that there was no changes made in cardiac rhythm. There's no changes where he tries to breathe on his own. There's no changes that are occurring. Um, and medical control was contacted um, just to see if there was any other suggestions or anything else that can be attempted or tried um, it's kind of like a I guess you, you can talk to a physician that's in the ER and say hey is there anything else that we can do um, and he advised that we discontinue CPR at that point um, and once that was stated um, the phone to, to make that call is in the ambulance so when you come back and you say, hey, we've got the order from the doctor to discontinue CPR, um, that is, you know, you, you stop CPR. Yeah. But once the CPR stopped, it kind of becomes a different scene, I guess, in the fact that before, you know, you're, you're cutting clothes off and you're, you're doing all the, the, the things necessary to treat the patient. Once you discontinue the CPR, especially in a situation like this, we kind of take a lot of extra care to make sure that we um, preserve anything that's on the scene, that um, we leave our interventions. We don't just like take everything out. We, we kind of leave him as he was. Um, and that's to assist when OMI gets there or investigative teams, we, we left him in the position that we found him after we're treating him. Obviously our priority is him, um, but once the discontinue order was given, that's kind of like, the point where we, we, we take that step back and we, we get our materials, we get our things, our machines or whatever like that, and, and we really try to, it turns into preserving that scene. Okay. Um, I think that's about it as far as timeline was. Okay. Thank you. So you said the location was west of Aquila. Do you remember the mall marker? Uh, not precisely, and, and dispatch didn't give us a, a mile marker. We were just told west of Aquila, I okay. think. If you don't know, it's okay. Yeah, I don't know. Okay, I'm not aware. No problem. We were just told west of Aquila, and we knew that that was going to be a scene that was going to be easy to find. We, right. We was on the highway, so. Okay. Um, so I know you described the position that he, um, the officer was laying in. What else did you see around him? Um, as far as like where he yeah going. like were there other agencies uh, were they already working on him by the time yes ma'am okay do you remember who was working on him before you arrived I don't 
I don't remember the the specific agencies. It wasn't really my like a, a dispatch had voiced at one point that it was Border Patrol. Okay. So I just kind of made the assumption that Border Patrol okay. um, was there. Um, once we got to the patient, our focus is him. I yeah. really don't care who else is there. But we knew state police was going to be showing up. We knew that other officers were going to be showing up. Um, but I I know that there we were told Border Patrol had... Um, Either they said either agents or medical staff okay. performing, and and so we at that point assumed we know Border Patrol's medical staff. It's like an EMT. Uh, we know it's not like a surgeon that's there, you know, working for Border Patrol. So we assumed that it was there. And then around him, um, we had s somewhere in his vicinity was the front of the vest. It was kind of taken off of him so that they could expose and just kind of placed to the side. Okay. Um, I know that there was, uh, I'm trying to think of anything else. There was a shell casing that was noted. Where at? On, it was on the shoulder, on the same, I guess this, we're talking about the south side, like eastbound shoulder. There was some sort of a shell casing that was noted. And are you able to tell like what kind of casing? Was it a long casing, short it casing? It was a long, longer casing. Okay. And then there was a, what I assume, there, there was something that looked like a bullet. What do you mean, where? It was also on the shoulder. Somewhere. A bullet? Yeah, it, or a, a fragment or something that, that was that looked like a piece of, like, lead or brass or something that would have... Was it near the officer or was it... It was on the shoulder. Okay. I, I couldn't tell you the exact location, but I know that when as we stepped back and you kind of looked around, make sure you're not going to step on anything or anyone, there was a shell casing and then there was like a, a, a bullet. And, and not, when I say bullet, I mean a bullet without the casing. Okay. Thank you for clarifying that. Yes, ma'am. Anything else? Um, not to my recollection. Like I said, d like there... You know, there was medical supplies and shears or stuff like that, but nothing that was noted elsewhere. Okay. All right, interview concluded at 1038.